All right, thanks everybody. Um, uh, where I'm going to start today, first of all, a little bit of background on me. Uh, so I'm a biologist. I've uh, worked for the last 20 years on a variety of different systems in the Northwest for the most part. I'm a consultant, so in the world of Bayesian networks, I'm very much a practitioner. I've been working with Bayesian networks for probably 15 years, worked with Bayesian Lab for about the last five years. So I'm going to talk uh, some uh, generally today about some of the things that I've been working through as, as we, as we uh, continue to evolve our processes and the scope and scale of the things that we can do with the tools that we have at hand. And so that's, that's where I'm going today. And I want to start with this, this figure that uh, Stefan often uses in his, in his webinars and it's in the, in, the, uh, in the textbook that they published a few years ago. And I think it does a really great job of illustrating the different ways we can use data and the amount of data we have in order to make inferences. And so, of course, up in the, up in the top left-hand corner, we have this kind of machine learning world. And I have been playing in that world uh, a, a little bit. I've, I've been able to, I've been fortunate enough to be able to publish a couple of papers in this piece, and which is not all that common in the ecology world where I work. The other place where Bayesian networks really got to start in my field is down in the bottom right, which is around the expert models. And Lionel was talking about that this morning and talking about some of the tools that um, they've been developing in order to uh, blend information, the expert information, the specified models based on expert information and bring some data into that. And I'm going to be focusing on that quite a bit today. And we have these two extremes. And so we have the situation where we have piles of data and we have places where we don't have a lot of data. And then there's this big piece in the middle, which is really for a long time has been kind of the domain of traditional statistics is the way I think of it. It's maybe not exactly in the center, but somewhere in there. So the idea is we don't necessarily have uh, it, it's not a big data issue, but we have some data based on samples, of course, we're making, uh, we, have, we have sampling data from, and we make some parametric assumptions about that sampling and then we, we draw our inferences from analysis based on that. And so we have this world in the center and, and my question really is, uh, is, there, is there, as we start to develop Bayesian networks and our workflows around that, is there a way that we can improve on the traditional statistics approach in this kind of middling area? Because we, I think we, 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 we straddle a very uncomfortable place, for those of you who train, or are trained in traditional statistics, on this, on this causation description um, dimension along this bottom, where we, we, we basically develop descriptive models with statistics, but we often want to uh, talk about them in a causal way without being particularly explicit about it. And so if you think about our traditional workflow, and this is the way it works in my field, you're probably working in, in something that's quite similar. And, I, and what I want to talk about is the traditional, uh, traditional statistics workflow based on observational data. So we're not talking about situations where we're developing experiments here, but situations where we have acquired or collected some observational data set <clears throat> that we want to make some inferences about. And what we do usually is we do some sort of preliminary analysis where we're looking at, say, the relationship between our predictor variables and our target variable. We're looking for things like multicollinearity or, or other aspects uh, that we need to um, adjust for, basically. We also often have some sort of dimensionality reduction process going on there. If we have some missing data or uh, to deal with the multicollinearity problem, we'll drop particular variables from our analysis, a number of things that we do in there. And then, of course, we, I, I don't know what, if, it's work, if it's working like this in your field, but these days it's pretty uncommon to do the kind of exhaustive stepwise kind of regression techniques where you're testing every possible model. <clears throat> in general, what we tend to do is come up with a few what we call biologically plausible models based on groups of variables, and then we'll actually conduct our regression analyses and compare the, the performance of these variables using some sort of information theoretic approach, looking for the most parsimonious variable. And so we go through this big, long string of fairly detailed work on the statistical side, all to get to the place where we just kind of make stuff up about causes and put it in the discussion section of our papers. So we've put this huge, big, all this effort in these blue boxes, 
we teach our students all this stuff to do this, and then we, we get to the end, we just kind of make it up and say, well, it could be this and it could be that. And I think the really, really dangerous part of this is it's that stuff that we kind of make up in the discussion paper that ends up getting baked into policy. So if anybody of you, of you are working in, in fields where you end up uh, have, where the results of your research uh, attract the attention of policymakers, it's obvious for me because of the field that I work in, but also say in health policy or et cetera, that's the problem. People are reading the discussion saying, well, that's what the experts are saying they think is going on, and that's what gets baked in. And so, and then there's this, this famous quote from Judea Pearl, and he puts it quite a lot more nicely than I do, because he's such a gentle and pleasant man. He just talks about, uh, how it's too bad that we're leaving causal considerations to the mercy of intuition and good judgment. So my interpretation of that is ma making stuff up and putting it in your discussion section. <clears throat> So yeah, a couple of problems with the traditional workflow on the statistics side. Obviously, we don't have a formal causal analysis. And the an that means that the analytically weakest part of what we're doing is driving the policy side. And the other piece is that, that the inferences that we can make from those kinds of analyses are data limited. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So you know that, uh, for those of you who've seen my presentations before, I do a lot of work. I've, I've talked about moose, I've talked about caribou. I also work on some other species. So I'm flipping up some, some photos of some of these other species that I work on. So not to get, uh, I don't want to get too uh, sidetracked on some of these species, but this is one that I work on in the Pacific Northwest. It's called the marbled muralette, just because it's, I don't, because it has marbled coloration. It's a little uh, kind of chicken-sized seabird although it doesn't taste like chicken because they eat fish and so I get that terrible oily flesh and nobody ever eats them. And the marbled murrelet has a very strange behavior because even though it's a seabird, it nests in trees and it will fly 50 to 100 miles inland in search of a nest tree and it nests exclusively in old growth forests. And because they have these little bills, they can't actually build their own nests. So they have to find these branches with these big spreading um, mats of moss on them and find one with a little cup in there that, that, that will hold the egg so it doesn't roll off out of the tree. And this crazy bird will fly back and forth. It feeds in the ocean and flies to the nest and does that every day, flying these ridiculous little fish. So it does that during incubation and then when it has to feed the chicks. And then when the chick hatches and grows enough, basically the, the chick will jump out of the nest and has to learn how to fly on the way down and fly the 50 and 100 miles back out to the ocean or else uh, it doesn't live and you find dead chicks at the bottom of trees. So there's, re there's usually reasons why species are endangered because they do some really dumb things sometimes. So who knows what it was that led to the evolution of this particular behavior. But it's one of the challenging species that we have obviously with the loss of a lot of the old growth, the original uh, old growth forests in the Pacific Northwest. So that's a little bit of a side. But I wanted to talk specifically about the data, the small data problem. And what I refer to here as a small data problem is, again, in this kind of middling area. We have situations, we know how to handle kind of the big, well, we, it's evolving, but we, we have strategies for the big data piece, and we have strategies for the no data piece. But the question is, what do we do when we have these data sets that are, say, limited naturally by the number of observations we can ever have? And, but nevertheless are in, uh, involved in, that are part of complex systems that have quite a few drivers. So the example here I'm showing, this is a map of British Columbia, and each one of these little blobs is uh, the location of a, a caribou herd that I work on, because I work on caribou. And so we have 54 of these different caribou herds. And of course, we want to know, now some of these, some of these herds are increasing, some of these herds are decreasing. And of course, the number one thing we want to know is, well, why are they increasing? And why are they decreasing? What's the difference between those? And can we intervene in some way in order to get those ones that are decreasing to increase? The thing is, when we're getting into the analysis of these herds, we only have 54 observations. We will never have any more than 54 observations because we have 54 herds. And so you end up with this situation where we have 
we're always going to have sparse data. We're always going to have sparse data, even though we may have several drivers, a number of drivers that we're trying to understand how they're affecting this system. So this, this is the way we need strategies for this. I feel very strongly that this is one of the, the major issues that we're running into. Um, and one of the things that we spend most of our time arguing about in the policy world are these places where we have naturally restricted data sets. And the other key piece, of course, here is if you can't do randomized controlled trials. So we can't do that with these caribou herds. We can't change their habitat. We can't randomly assign different habitats to them. We can't do that. We can't change where they exist on, say, a latitudinal gradient. We can't change things. So we're, 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 we're stuck in, these, uh, in this situation. And so what we usually do is we default to just doing very, very simple statistics. So we're just doing correlations. So, uh, and, and so I, I, this is a, I've actually shown this before, but I think there's a statute of limitations on showing old slides from my old talks now. But uh, we run this, this, this regression analysis. We only have 24 data points. And I say, well, wait, 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 wait. Before we start managing to this relationship, don't you think there might be some confounders that we should be taking a look at here? And I hear, well, yeah, but we only had 24 data points. So it's not like we could just include a whole bunch of other factors in our, in our analysis. We simply don't have the data for that. And I said, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean the confounders aren't there. They, they're still there. So uh, how, how, do we, how do we address this problem? Or the other thing, too, are unobservable vari unobserved variables. So, well, maybe it's confounded. And the answer is, well, yeah, we know that's probably going on, but we can't do anything about it because we can't collect data on it. I say, well, yeah, but it's super important to keep that stuff in your model uh, if you suspect that's going on from a causal analysis point of view. But what happens is, and, and it's hard to blame them for this, because, because we have these naturally restricted data sets, we end up restricting our statistical analysis, and that really restricts our thinking around understanding the causal structure of the data generating process. And of course, one thing I can blame them for is when we get to the bottom and they say, yeah, but look at the R squared, it's really high. This is a complex system, we got this high R squared, it's gotta be important, right? So, which is a fancy way of saying, well, yeah, correlation is causing, is causal, is, is what they're really saying. So, these are the kinds of things we find ourselves in. And if you think it's something that's just restricted to my field, I think this happens in quite a few places. So, this, for instance, is a list of OECD countries. So, every, you, you turn, every time you turn around, you hear a study, well, amongst OECD countries, you have, uh, you know, this is important or this isn't important. But of course, there's only, what, 35 or 40 OECD countries, hugely complex situations. So if, what if you wanted to do an analysis of the effects of uh, tax policy on economic growth? You only have 35 data points. You will only have 35 data points because that's how many countries you have. Uh, it happens in other places, sports teams. So I found this, this, um, this abstract. Effective time zone and game time changes on team performance national football league. So there's, okay, you're gonna test my American trivia. How many teams are there in the NFL? 30, 28, 32, something like that? 32, football fan, okay. So we got 32 teams in the national football league. And so they do this analysis on win-loss records. And yeah, for night games, West Coast teams, whether home or away, appear to be at a distinct advantage over East and Central teams. Okay, now do you think there might be in this time period that we're looking for something that might be influencing the win-loss ratio of these, of these teams, of West Coast teams? There could be some plausible other explanation that could confound that other than time zone. But of course, when you're only dealing with X number of teams, you're only gonna be able to look at these kind of single factor issues and you're missing the bigger picture in something that might be more complex. So that's the kind of thing that I'm, that I'm kind of interested in and developing some kind of alternative workflow using Bayesian networks and being formalized about this to try to, to, try to address bas basically these two problems. The first is that we're really missing a formal causal analysis uh, because we're, we're uh, basically reverting to very, very simple statistical measures. Or in the second case, we're, we have some data but not a lot of data and we're never going to have enough. And, and, and this has really evolved for me just over the years when I when I come to these conferences and these great tools, if, and it's like, oh, well, if only I had a million observations, the things I could do, but I've got six, or I've got 12, or I've got 50, or I've got 30, that kind of thing. So what can we do about this? This is the bighorn sheep. I also work on this species. 
very interesting because they tend to use sites that are uh, reclaimed mine sites and they do extremely well in those areas. But there's other factors that are influencing their population. They actually do quite well, um, we actually think they'll do quite well with climate change because they like uh, dry grasslands where there's not uh, where, where, where there's not a lot of forest encroachment because they like to see what's going on so they can stay away from predators. So as time goes on, we think uh, some of the grasslands are going to expand in central and, and southern parts of British Columbia, and it's actually going to benefit this particular species. Um, but yeah, and but what I've been looking at is uh, how they interact with reclaimed mine sites and how we treat those sites and, and how their populations respond. Okay, so the small, so I'm talking about the small data thing. Now there's always the data free option, right? So we know that we could always build and parameterize a model based on expert elicitation. Bayesian Lab, of course, has the, the BK tool to do this, which I think is a great tool. And, I, and there are certainly very good applications for that. <clears throat> that the, what I find though, it's kind of interesting is that, and I've done this kind of thing, I've done expert elicitation workshops, and it, and it seems the more quantitative people are in the room, they respond to this in such a way that you know, I'll, I'll say, well, we want your opinion on, on completing this conditional probability table for this particular relationship. And somebody say, yeah, well, didn't, didn't somebody publish a paper on that? I, I seem to remember somebody publishing a paper. Can we pull out that paper? And someone else say, oh, is that right? Yeah, we should take a look at that. And then I say, no, 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 I just want your opinion on this. We don't have time to start digging in the literature. And they kind of look at me in this kind of mystified way, which is, yeah, but if we have information on this, shouldn't we be pulling that out and using it? Why are you just asking my opinion about this stuff? And it's kind of an awkward conversation, actually. So in, in some ways, it's easier to build this stuff when there's no data. It's almost easier to build it when there's no data, when there's some data that people want to rely on. And sometimes if they do start pulling out these papers, you end up with just looking at some of these simple correlations, and that kind of anchors them a bit and can actually serve as a, as a bit of a bias because they haven't actually thought through the implications of this. So I, I find actually managing uh, partial data to be a, a challenging thing with experts, and the more quantitative they are, the more of a challenge that happens to be. The other tricky thing here is, I, the way I express it here, is small experts can be as, pro, as big a problem to manage as small data. And what I man, mean by that is in, in fields such as endangered species management where I work, that it's a very politically charged issue. So if you're going to have an expert elicitation workshop, you're going to spend a long time deciding who's the experts. Because who's sitting around the table ultimately is going to decide how this model is going to look. And so you have uh, scientists from environmental uh, and organizations, you have government scientists, you have academics, you have First Nations uh, Aboriginal experts as well and their traditional knowledge. And, and so there's a, a very key piece around who gets to sit at that table. And of course, one of the, one of the key parts of the Beaky workflow is addressing this issue of, bi of, of, of biases or at least uh, uncovering the, the amount of knowledge that all these experts have. But what we're really doing is in, in trying to address the biases in the data, we end up trying to address the biases in our experts. So that's a bit of a challenge. And finally, I find that I, I've built a lot of expert models over the years, but as soon as there's some data on it, uh, it, it kind of trumps everything because it'll be, hey, you know, that model that you did with all those experts, that was great but now we've got some data. So all that gets thrown out, even if the data are weak, they still want to actually focus in that. So as soon as we start to have some data show up on this stuff, people want to focus on that. So again, how can we, how can we do a better job of blending this stuff? Now on this workflow and the whole issue of uh, uh, policy development, again, going back to the textbook, there is this piece in the, the chapter that was done with, with Felix on uh, the causal analysis chapter, and, and spells it out here. And, and, and I think this all stands, but you see on the, we're in this workflow too, and in this little box it says, generate a causal Bayesian network from a CDAG and data, so causal uh, directed acyclic graph and data. So I wanna focus in on that box and talk about, okay, what, how, do, what, what's exactly, how do we exactly go through that? And so what I'm thinking about in, in terms of this alternative workflow is to that, that, we, that we go through these steps. So we, we're actually drafting the causal DAG up in the top and then a, an explicit causal identification. I'm not going to talk about that today. There's other resources on that. And then to specify our model 
Lionel talked this morning about fully specified models with expert data. That's the next step. And then updating the parameters with whatever data we have. So yes, let's use our expert opinion, but the thing is that <clears throat> let's use as much data we have. You have two observations, you have 20 observations, whatever it is, let's get those into our model so we can always say that our model is, a, is, is uh, describing the best situation using the most information we have. Uh, then some sort of internal review for consistency of your model with the data that you do have, and then moving on to uh, estimating effects. Uh, oh, another species picture. So this is the, um, the Townsend's big-eared bat, which you can probably understand why it's called a big-eared bat. So my, my wife is a biologist too. She works on small endangered species. I work on big endangered species. So this is her holding a couple of these bats. The bat world, they have not a great rep tra track record with naming their animals, their species. So the big-eared bat, pretty obvious. The most common bat in North America is this little, uh, little tiny brown bat, and it's called the brown, the little brown bat. And <clears throat> there's another species that is a little bit bigger than that, and it's called the big brown bat. And so, but there's also a little species, a little, just like the little, uh, the little brown bat, it's almost exactly the same, but it lives in California, so that's the California bat, because they just have to be a little bit different in California, don't they? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my beloved caribou to talk about this example, but I, I, a lot of the talks I've given are up in the boreal forests so northern Canada. A lot of people, when they think of caribou, they think of them out on the tundra, on the Arctic tundra. But we actually have caribou that range much farther south. They're called woodland caribou because they live in the woods. Yeah, I guess we're not much better at naming our species, are we? In the, but they, they range quite far south. And that, in fact, they were just extirpated from the lower 48 just um, a few years ago, last year, year before, something like that. They used to dip just right into the, the top of the, at, at the top of the Idaho panhandle. They used to just put a hoof over the border every once in a while, but they've been gone for a few years. But they live in this sort of environment, high alpine, not, not super high alpine, still in the woods. You can see those tracks there, those are from snowmobiles. So that's one of the concerns because it's beautiful snowmobiling habitat in there. So people love to snowmobile, but they can displace the caribou. We can get three, four, five meters of snow, 15, 20 feet of snow in these areas. So massive snow loads. These caribou have big hoofs so they can float on top of the snow and they eat lichens out of the trees. That's what they subsist on all winter. There's a huge number of issues. They're in decline for a variety of reasons. I'm not gonna talk specifically about that. But one thing I am going to talk about is that there's this kind of latest stress that, that everyone's concerned about and how it may affect the caribou, and that's this thing called, I don't know if you heard of it, climate change. It's in the news quite a bit. So there's a lot of interest in knowing what is it that is driving, what, what are the expected impacts of climate change on caribou? And here's, here I have a map, maps of uh, British Columbia, and basically the greener the, habit, the, greener the, the areas on the map the better the habitat is. So you can see these are projections of what we think the habitat is going to look like over time, starting from the 2000s and going through the 2000, to the 2080s. You can see by the, by the 2080s that the things are not nearly as green as they were in, in the 2000s. So the question that we're asking, what's the expected effects of climate change as these habitats shrink, how's that going to affect population trajectories for this species? And secondarily, if that's going to be the trajectory, are there things we can do? So how can we intervene on this system to improve conditions and maybe compensate or counteract this loss of habitat and maintain caribou on the landscape? So again, we can't do a randomized controlled trial experiment. You know, climate change, is all, we're basically looking at, we, we can't run that experiment. So we, we're dealing with observational data, climate projections, what we've collected over time in terms of uh, population trends, etc., conditions of the habitat. So that's what we're trying to do. So I just want to step through the, 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 the steps that, that I've been going through in, in kind of leading this. And there's a couple other projects that are quite similar that have to deal with the same sort of thing. The first thing, obviously, is to develop the causal model. So basically, it's just getting the boxes and arrows right. And this is iteration number four. So one thing that I've learned about developing causal models is that they are never done because there's always going to be somebody with an idea. Nine out of the 10 ideas that people come forward with are bad, but every once in a while you say, yeah, no, that makes sense, it should probably be in the model. 
but it takes a lot of effort. It takes uh, a lot of um, dedication to be and a lot of fortitude to keep people from just keeping adding boxes and arrows because there's always the tendency. You always have to manage this uh, that, that to try to keep things reasonable um, and but it's a constantly evolving process. So in this particular one, the box in the middle, the population trend, lambda is the, is, the, is the measure that we use. So population trend, that's what we're trying to get above one, basically. If you have a population, a, a lambda of greater than one, that means the population is growing. So it's really, what's the probability of having a positive population trend in the future? And then we have another, a number of drivers from that. They're color-coded according to things that we can control, for instance, so the orange boxes, linear density, so that's how many roads we build. Uh, public recreation is done on the bottom right-hand corner, so how much of the areas do we let people go snowmobiling in? And then there's one over on the right-hand side, early Cyril, that's related to how much logging we have go on. And then there's things that we can't really do much about, and so that's around this habitat loss, this core, core habitat loss, which is due to climate change. The other thing that happens is as the climate warms, it's bad for the caribou, but it's also very favorable to species like the, the, the mighty moose that you had on that slide, Stefan. So other species that are favored by climate change uh, might displace the caribou, or there's some complex dynamics to go through there with, with as those, in, those populations increase, there's more predators, they kill the caribou, it's kind of complex. So that's what's in these light, this light blue pathway around the predator prey. So we just try to specify, let's get our causal DAG first. So let's do this first. Let's not start with the data analysis and reason from data to theory. Let's start with theory and reason to data. And, and, and that's, you know, we've heard that before if you've been to any of these events and, and some of the related courses. But it's a constant reminder. Let's move from theory to data, establish what the theory is first, come to some, some, uh, some uh, understanding amongst everybody on, on on how we think the system was working, and then see what we can do on the data side uh, to fill that in. And then we have to specify the model. And, and quite honestly, I find this actually to be the most challenging step uh, when we're dealing with either small data or no data, mostly because conditional probability tables are very, very flexible. So you can manually enter every single probability in a table if you want. Uh, we can use we can use functions. We can use equations. We can use distributions. There's all kinds of ways that we can populate these uh, conditional probability tables. But the question is, if we're dealing with if we want to start with the expert opinion, if we want to start with those priors, what's the most defensible way that we can do that? What's the thing that we can if we just start filling in numbers in a table, uh, then that gets very onerous to try to explain the assumptions behind every one of those numbers. And so we need some kind of rules to establish that. And, and where I've landed is, is kind of some simple rules. And, and the first one is that, okay, you need to decide, well, how many states are we going to put in these, in, these, uh, in these nodes? And I think it's important that we obviously not have too many if we're just dealing uh, with some of this expert stuff. So it's feasible to have three or four, but it's probably better than having two because then at least you can start to pick up on whether or not there's some nonlinearities in our relationships, because that's obviously one of the strengths that we're working with here with, uh, with Bayesian networks is that we're not held to these, these uh, parametric assumptions. We can detect these nonlinearities, so I think it's important to do that. The other thing, too, is that if we're thinking about the relationship between parent and child nodes, I think that there's two pieces of information that we can safely glean from the experts that they're willing to provide without feeling that they're going out on a limb and starting to make assumptions. And the first is, you know, obviously the direction. So does, does, the child, does the parent cause the child to go up or down? It's as simple as that. Is it a positive relationship or is it a negative relationship? We first have to encode that. That's helpful. The second thing is if you have two or more parents, what's the relative strength of those inputs in their influence on the outputs? So, and, and basically, I've just taken to saying, if, if people think it, uh, that, that parent A is twice as important as parent B, then I just encode it as two times, and then kind of work it all out in the CPT. So I find that I elicit the kind of the top level, either I do it myself or I consult colleagues around this, but it's either, you know, is it a positive or a negative relationship? And then very simply kind of 1x, 2x, 3x, what's the relationship? amongst the parents and how they're affecting uh, uh, the, the child nodes. 
and then coming up with some sort of rules for how I would, would specify this initial prior table. And so that's an example how, of how I would do it, for instance, for, for, for a, a very simple um, situation where you've got three states in two parent nodes influencing one child with, with, uh, with three states. And then the last thing, once I get there, is then to assign the plausible intervals for the state. So often I'll start with low, moderate, high. That's easy for under, un, people to understand. So one of the variables that I deal with, for instance, might be road density. So I'll start saying, okay, well, if, do you think a high road density has an effect on this node? You know, is it a positive or negative relationship? We, we do all that and then say, okay, now what are the, the plausible intervals that we would assign to a high road density? What do we mean by that? Is that five kilometers per square kilometer or five kilometers per 10 square kilometers? That sort of thing. And then we establish those, those intervals. So now we have the fully specified model. So really we've got to a point where it's, it's not too fancy, but it's kind of capturing the key pieces. What are the most important drivers in terms of expert opinion? What's the direction that those drivers are taking? And what's the form of the causal model? So it's fully functional at that point. And everybody's pretty happy about that. But then everybody's, somebody's always going to say, ah, oh, yeah, that's just your opinion. You know, we got some data on that. We should really do something with that. And so then we get to the, then we move into the updating parameters. And so this is an example of the kind of data sets that I often find myself working with. So with respect to this particular climate change issue, we don't have a lot of data. We only have a few points. So the, the X, these are the, all the univariate relationships between our, our, our driving, the, the drivers in this model, what their univariate relationship is with our target node. And you can see it's kind of all over the place. And in, in some cases, we have very few points and not really showing much of a trend at all. In other places, we have something that looks OK. And in some cases, we have relationships that are opposite to what the experts thought were going on. <laughs> so that's the other thing, too. So we have this situation where we have experts who say, yeah, I think that's working just the way I thought it was going to work. And then we start to look at the data. And actually, it's not, that's not what's being reflected in the data. Um, but I think, that's, I think that's OK. But I mean, the main thing here is that there's no way that you could build a six-factor quantitative model just on those data sets. You, you couldn't do it. There's just too few data to build that model. But the advantage of using your fully specified Bayesian network up front is that you have already baked in a lot. You've done a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the re what you think is the relative strength of these, of these relationships and the direction of that relationship, all that stuff is already baked in. So now, now you're, now you're kind of tuning, you're turning the dials with the, uh, with the data. And so that's what we're doing. And so um, now, we're, now we want to do that blending. So we want to do basically our Bayesian updating through this. So Lionel mentioned this morning the, the change that came in, in version 8 of Bayesian Lab, which was super important to me, which was this, uh, this parameter updating and talking about the, the particles. Basically, we're assuming that there's, there's so many particles that are in this specified model. And then we have so many particles from the data that we have. And we're blending those to update our conditional probability tables according to the, uh, whatever data we have. And so again, there's some assumptions we have to make. So how much are we actually weighting the expert uh, data against the expert opinion against the data that we have? Obviously, you can tune that so it has a greater effect or a lesser effect. So I don't know. I, I just kind of hit hit it 50-50. I basically set a prior that's that's uh, prior weight that's equal to the number of observations I have in my observational data set. Is that the best rule? I don't know. I'm just kind of making up it as I as I go along, trying to figure out as I try to work through this workflow. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a super important piece because this is, this is the special sauce that allows us to do the kind of the optimal blending of this expert opinion with the data that we have. And then I just, just a couple of checks on the internal consistency of this. So um, because we do have some observational data, we would like to know whether or not our final model is reflect how it does with actually predicting the performance of the data that we do have. So here I have observed output versus our predicted output. If, if, it was, if it was a perfect fit, all of our blue dots would be lining up along the hypotenuse. And it's clearly not. Obviously, on the left-hand side, it's just based on our expert opinion. 
once we once I move the data into the model, do the parameter updating, that's what I get on the right. Yeah, and it and it shrinks stuff up. It, it it's a little tighter along that curve. There are some that are still outliers, but that's actually pretty useful because you can say, well, this information for this one area doesn't seem to that's not really following the model. What's going in, on in that one area that we need to understand a little bit better? So we can we can either revise our model or we live with it one or the other. Um, now the nice thing, of course, is if you move from your from your prior model to your parameter updated model, you'd like all those dots to be moving in the right direction, all towards that hypotenuse. That also doesn't happen sometimes, especially if you have some contrary information in your in your observed data set. So I I mentioned the situation where you have uh, where where you have basically observed observed information that's contrary to what the experts think is going on. So you basically have the two data sets fighting with each other. And so that's obviously going to affect um, uh, the performance of the model in terms of the fit of the data to it. Uh, but you kind of line it up and you make a decision of whether or not you think that's a, a, a good fit or not. And then you can move on to your next part, uh, which is understanding the estimated effects. And so this, this kind of gets a little more standard in terms of some of the things we're doing. So going back to this caribou model and understanding the climate drivers, uh, I find the tornado diagrams to be super useful. So this is the sensitivity of the uh, probability of a positive population trend in 2080. What's the likelihood that our populations are going to be increasing in 2080? What are the key, what's the, what are the key drivers? How, how much of an influence are these different variables having? And right at the top, is this habitat piece. So basically what it's saying is the most important driver in the model is that habitat piece. So climate change is going to have a, a significant effect on, on the viability of these herds. The next one is around some of these other populations that are expected to benefit. So our two top causes of our probability, the two top variables that are most sensitive, that, are, that the model is most sensitive to are both related to climate change. And then there's things that we have control over. We can log less, although we may log less, but the, it might burn because we have more, more forest fires. So that's, that's sort of partly under management control. We can control where people are snowmobiling. We can control uh, how many roads we're building, but they're farther down on the list. And what that leads into is, is something like this, because I said, well, okay, how, how well can we compensate for some of these losses that we're seeing? And what I have on here is the blue bars, that's the probability of a positive population trend in 2080, and these are for a few of the herds, and those are the blue bars, so you can see that the probabilities are very low. So that second one, the upper Fraser, that blue bar is at 5%. So what that's saying is, okay, with climate change and everything else stays the same, it doesn't get any worse, but it just stays the way things are now, there's only a 5% chance we're going to be seeing a positive population response by the time we get to 2080. And then in the orange bars, we say, okay, what if we can turn everything up to 11 on the things that we can do? What if we really, we're just gonna kick all the snowmobilers out. We're gonna stop logging. We're gonna suppress fires. We're not, in, not just gonna stop building roads. We're gonna debuild the roads. We're gonna put it all back together. If we did all of that, how would that affect those? What, what would that, um, what do we think the expected impact of that would be on the caribou populations? And we can see the orange bars, they're all bigger. They're all bigger. And so that third one, that Revel, Revelstoke shoe swap one, for instance, it jumps from, what's that, 15%, 10%, 10%, I guess, 10% to almost 50%. So nearly a five-fold increase in the probability of a positive population trend, but it's still below 50%. So even after doing everything that we can think of doing, it's still a coin flip in 60 years as to whether we're going to be generating a positive population response. So these are, these are key findings that are going to influence our policy around where we think we can recover caribou, what are the management actions we can put on the ground, and what's our, what's our, probab what are, what, what's our opinion about the probability that we are going to be successful in generating a positive population response. And like I said, I don't think that we could do this unless we had the foundation of expert opinion that is being baked into our models using a Bayesian network, because we simply don't have the data to develop a fully parameterized uh, parametric model and uh, not in any sort of reliable way. Uh, also mapping, obviously. So this is the other output I use quite a bit. Very helpful. Um, although this is a causal model, and you can't put arrows on 
this. So I, and, and, or identify the target node. I don't, I don't know why that. You can. Oh, you can highlight the target node in some place? There's a star for the target node, okay, yeah. But yeah, I think arrows would be helpful. Um, I, I, I guess this is because this, probably, this feature probably started for unsupervised learning. Oh, we're pointing at Denis, it's his fault, is it? Oh. Sorry for the public shaming. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure it's a lot easier than the uh, Python code export no model, module. That's what I'm guessing. But anyway, that's my suggestion, is just to be able to put some, put some arrows on, on uh, so when, we, when, we're, when we're trying to map causal models. Uh, the other thing, too, obviously, is when, what, when I was saying is that uh, the, the result I presented in this, in this last slide was when we turn everything up all the way. But of course, there's lots, the next thing that people say is, well, what if we didn't turn it up all the way? What if we only turned it up halfway in this situation and a quarter of the way over here? Everybody wants to tune the knobs. And obviously, I can't write a report that covers all those things. I mean, we can, we can do some of that with some of the tools. But of course, that's where the simulator uh, comes in. And, and I uploaded this particular model to the Bayesian Lab Simulator, so you can all go there and take a look if you want. It's kind of bare bones. I hope to build it out over the next little while. Um, but I, I think it's a really useful thing to be able to point to, because people always want, instead of trying to write a giant report that covers all this stuff, say, well, here, just go do it yourself, and uh, let me know what you think. OK, so that's about all I wanted to cover at this point. I just want, so a couple of conclusions. They're not really conclusions, but maybe more of a call to arms. This idea that, that, I, that I think we need some sort of evolving workflow that can, can replace the kind of traditional statistics workflow that is, is really aimed at, at formalizing this causal paradigm, because I think it's, it's one, obviously one of the weakest things that we're dealing with when we're dealing with uh, traditional statistics, and one of the greatest benefits that, that we can bring to this uh, from our field in influencing a lot of different areas. And the, and the second thing, of course, is this idea of, of, uh, of blending that expert knowledge and data to address the small data problem. That's not new to Bayesian networks, obviously, but I think that there's, uh, there's some decisions in there, especially in the handling of the expert, the expert data uh, and, and setting these things up for success that um, I'm certainly still thinking about, and I'm, I'm hoping we can have some conversations about that over the next couple of, couple of days. So thanks very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, and I, I have to explain the last slide, because I've been explaining the pictures in most places. So this is Haida Gwaii. This is uh, better known as the Queen Charlotte Islands. They changed the name a few years ago to the traditional Aboriginal name. It's, it's an eight-hour ferry ride west of Vancouver Island, way out in the Pacific. And um, you'll see that this, it may not be obvious, but there's no shrubs in this picture. It's all just moss. And the reason for that is, is uh, black-tailed deer were introduced to these islands. And uh, the black-tailed deer are native to the west coast of, of, of North America, but they weren't native here. They were introduced here. There were no predators, and the populations exploded. And they have some of the highest deer densities in the world. If you want to go deer hunting, you can shoot 15. So that's a pretty good place if you're a deer hunter. You can fill your freezer, take a lot of deer home. But it has completely altered the ecosystem having these deer, and it has cascaded through pretty much every aspect of the ecology, affecting raptors, small mammals, you name it. And so dealing with this particular problem in, in say, what's the extent that we can control deer through hunting? How much recovery can we expect to see from, a, from that action in some of these ecosystems and some other endangered species that we're concerned about? Another complex system that I think it lends itself to this causal modeling um, supplanted with data. Thank you very much.